Welcome, dear listeners. I'm Jonathan Carlin. And I'm Benjamin Carlin. And we invite you to join us through the Gryffindor, your one-way ticket to the enchanting world of Harry Potter. So grab your wands, dust off your broomsticks, and join us as we unlock the treasures behind Chamber of Secrets, Chapter 3, The Burrow. Treasures. Did yeah. You, you changed it up a little bit there? I did. Actually, yeah, I changed yeah. it up last time. I don't know if you caught it then, but I did. Yeah, because I was like, otherwise, I was saying secrets for Philosopher's Stone, but then I'm like saying it twice, and it just sounded weird. <laughs> okay, now I now I feel so silly if, if I also recognized it in the last one. If I didn't realize you did it in the last one, I almost kind of love that. Oh. But, if, but if I've now caught you twice doing it, that would also be that would like mildly embarrassing. It's yeah. Like, ha! Look, you changed the thing. It's like, yeah, we, we've, we've covered this. The question, the question will be, if, is if in Prisoner of Azkaban, if I go back to secrets or if I stick with treasures or if it's like a, maybe this is an un, uh, like a, a thing, a word I change per book or Ooh, something. Oh, I kind of love you that. Know? I yeah. love that. That could be something kind of like fun and exciting to look forward to. <laughs> I know. The, the uh, intro change. The intro change. <laughs> what are they going to do next? What? Um, that being said, though, Jay, I am so very excited for Chapter 3, The Burrow of Chamber of Secrets. Um, I think that this is a, a just truly delightful chapter of Harry Potter where we get to see the first ever uh, well the collection of Harry from number four perfect drive uh, f- via the turquoise flying Ford Anglia vehicle yep. a la Arthur Weasley uh, we get some Fred and George action in there Harry gets to go to the burrow for the very first time we get more time with Molly we get more time with Arthur well, it's the first time we see Arthur first time we see Arthur. yeah yeah that's yeah. true yep that's true so uh, which is which is a pretty neat I've got some notes about the the intro with with Arthur that we'll get to um, <laughs> there's a, I love so many things about this chapter it's like I also feel like it's a it, the whole chapter feels like it is a direct almost comparison between like Molly and Petunia like yes it, like the life at the burrow could not be more the exact opposite than life at number four private drive which by the way like one of the things that that I was like noticing is that Harry's delivery and this is jumping ahead just a tiny bit but his delivery to the burrow happens directly at sunrise. Oh, yeah. Whereas his delivery to number four Privet Drive happens at midnight. Oh, you're right. Which I think is kind of like a neat, like, I, I think that's an intentional contrast <laughs> between those two moments because, like, sunrise, I think I think night represents darkness, which is, like, the antithesis of Harry's whole objective, yeah. which is, you know, driven by, like, light and positivity. Yeah. And, and so, to me, the fact that, like, the sun is, like, just starting to come over the horizon as he's, like, arriving at the burrow, like, right. that, that's it's ne- like, neatly tying together. It's like the the long night is over yes, a little bit, yes, you know. Yeah, yeah like yeah. We, you've been delivered from your parents' wreckage. Ten years of dark night, and now boom, the sun is rising as you arrive at the Weasleys. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. The, that's the, pretty cool. The red sun as you the arrive red sun. At, at the Weasleys. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, the red sun. Oh man, that's it's it, it, like it's almost one of those things where like like if Harry like is is the red sun to the Weasleys, like the oh. family full of children. Yeah, because uh, you know it's like he doesn't have the red hair but if he's yeah. like the red sun he's the know. black sun you the know bla- oh, yeah <laughs> that's right yeah the uh, super jet black hair yeah um, that reminds that's like uh well because like red moon is like the the ship name for ron and luna oh you're right yeah. yes yes it is <laughs> yes so <laughs> who would be the red sun what's that ship that's got to be ron and someone else probably someone's name's got to mean sun certainly somewhere yes, in there who is, who is the sunniest character we've got yeah colin creevy colin creevy <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that's a ship you don't see often. Yeah, that's a, not the most common one. <laughs> nope. Um, but anyway, yeah. No, so I'm excited to talk about this chapter. I think there's a lot of like really good stuff packed in here. Um, and uh, without any further ado, what do you think about the uh, the chapter art for Chapter 3, The Burrow? Dude, I actually really like it in contrast to Dobby at the last chapter yes. where I thought it was terrible. Like a lot of times I don't love the depiction of the car. I feel like they um, in Chamber of Secrets and a lot of like the cover art, I feel like they lean on the car in a lot of things. And like it, it's a good thing to not on this one. Maybe it is on the cover. I was of trying ours. to see if it was on the cover of ours. I don't think it is No, but um, I know it shows up a bunch and it's like I, I think they do that because it's a great way to be like, look at this magical thing. This is behaving in a way it's not like you clearly still know it's like a magical thing, but it also doesn't like spoil anything Like you don't see the bass. Like you can't put the basilisk on the cover. That's true. And, you know, um, so well, I, I don't know. No, the one we had as kids had the sword on it. I guess you sort of knew he was going to get a sword. Maybe oh, that's if you true. paid attention yeah. close enough. Um, this one, I guess the one we're looking at the our our cover right now. I don't know if we've talked about it since we've um, started doing Chamber of Secrets, but it's the same. It's the same style. It's like this sort of like pencil, uh, really nice artwork, but and it's got lots of like Easter eggs in it. So you can see like the spiders and Dobby and Draco. And I guess there is 
a snake. There is a snake, but <coughs> it seems like the snake could could just as easily could just be, be slithering. slithering. Yeah. yeah, like you you wouldn't look at that and be like, oh, the monster's a snake. You'd just be like, oh, it's the Chamber of Secrets, which is about Slytherin, so that's why there's a snake. Right, and, and in this lower left corner, I think we've got is Was that, that Tom, Tom Riddle? Riddle? I think, I it, think is. it is. Oh, you're absolutely right. It is Tom Riddle. Of course, you'd have no way of knowing. No, that would be a that'd be a all. master. Th- the uh, the Draco on the front cover here looks a little deranged. He's kind of like a real, he does like a little, bit of like a bulging eye going. I guess on is there. that uh, also supposed to be Ginny? Holding the book. I think it's supposed to be Jenny uh, holding so. the book. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, right. but that's, anyway, uh, people can't see this. This is a great podcast talk. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's describe an image for you. No, but going back to our, our chapter art, just to continue to do this exact same thing. I do. The, I, I do like the the image here. Uh, one of the things I do always find interesting is that it's th- like I in my head have just made the car blue because yeah. of like the films. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the other depictions. But so the turquoise does always throw me off. Like I, I can never imagine what it would look like if they flew up in like a purple car. Well, turquoise is like a blue green. Is turquoise a blue green? Yeah. Do I? I think I've done this before. I don't even think this is the first <laughs> time I've. Oh my gosh! I'm like here. I am having a point about something. Yeah, like, and oh, I've it's just supposed turqu- to be purple. Yeah. Wow. Oh my gosh! I'm just an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that in the movie they get it pretty close to right. Yeah, maybe you're right. Yeah. Maybe you're right. Okay, so anyway, scratch all of that. <laughs> Apparently, part of my brain wants to pic- picture the car as purple. As purple, yeah. yeah. That's so funny that like your whole life you've been like, I don't know why they made it blue. Like it says turquoise. It's, it's says, purple. It's purple. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, I don't know what what word, what word am I even thinking of that would be adjacent I know, like, to what, turquoise. What, yeah, what what purple color starts with a T? It, there might something. be a, 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 a very light shade of purple on my face right now due to the sheer embarrassment <laughs> pouring out of me. <laughs> <laughs> that is such like a that's such like a glass shattering where we're like, what? Dang it. It's just a, this weird gap in knowledge. I know. That's so silly. And I, yeah. it's like, I don't even think, I mean, yeah, like, I don't know. I now just feel like a anyway, it doesn't matter. All right, so let's the, move right ahead on. Yeah, let's just dive on in. Um so yeah, so we we did end uh chapter two with one of my all time faves. It's it's the cliffhanger of Harry waking up to see the face of Ron Weasley looking at him through his barred windows at the Dursleys. Yes. Um, oh man, so yeah, and then uh what they are there to do is to come rescue Harry from the house. Ron, I love that Ron's first thing is like, I've asked you about 12 times to stay. And I'm like, what dedication? The number of letters he sent. I know. I mean, know? That, that, it truly is, though. It's like it's like one of these things where he's like, I know Harry wanted to come and see me this summer. Right. I'm mailing another letter. That's I know. it. I'm just like, going to keep what, going. What must this have felt like from Ron's point of view? Like, like Harry's sitting there concerned that like people aren't sending him letters, but they are. So from Ron's point of view, he must be like, well, Harry didn't really like me very much. Dude, I've uh, sent actually, him like 12 letters. This is the, what? What is going on? Oh God! Think about think about this though, literally, because you'd also have Ginny who's been like gushing over Harry like all summer break. Yeah. And so from Ron's perspective, he's coming home being like, "Yeah, remember that Harry guy we met on the platform? He's like, that's Harry Potter, and he is my best friend." Yeah. And then Ginny's like, "Oh my gosh, I can't wait! Like, I'm going to school this year. I'm going to meet Harry Potter. I can't wait to meet Harry Potter." And yeah. Ron's over there like, "Yeah, well, I don't know if we're gonna. I don't know if you actually liked me. I know. Like, gosh, you know, like that would be so <laughs> tough. Whew. Thought we did the chess match to get you. We had like." Chess match. We had a we had a moment. I thought, but I know, yeah. maybe I don't know. Right, we, we won all those points. We yeah. you know, house cup. I like, know, man. It Hermione. Seemed, it seemed like we were we were pretty tight. I wonder if he's ready for Hermione. Know. I know, uh, but I guess part of his rationale is that he doesn't think his owl Errol is maybe making the trip. Although Errol missing the trip. 11, 12 times would be kind of like, dude, get another owl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. at that point in time, which yep. they, which they did get Hermes uh, for Percy, which is like one of those. Uh, I just highlighted this like a trivia fun fact simply just because it's like like if you were to ask me off the cuff, what is the name of Percy's owl? I don't know if I could always pull it off. Oh, off, yeah. Off Hermes. Yeah, yeah, that'd be a tricky one. That's a tricky one. <clears throat> um, they also Ron also knows that Harry got the official warning for using magic in front of muggles, uh, which I think this is interesting that, you know, Harry or he says, how did he know? And he says he works for the ministry. <laughs> it's like to me. It's like how on earth did it not come up in the entire first year? What Ron's dad does. Oh, that or the fact you know? that that <laughs> Harry gets into his bed Bedroom at the end of this chapter where the walls are plastered with Chudley Cannon's posters. Yeah. And it never like Harry made the Quidditch team in the most remarkable fashion and it never came up who Ron's favorite team was. Oh, I know. I know. He like, didn't bring a poster to school with him. I know. Like even Dean Thomas has a picture of like, you know, soccer players. Right. Up right. in there. Ron has covered every inch of his room in Chudley Cannon stuff and doesn't like bring a poster like he must love them. I know. I you know. know. Yeah, the, what like, else is interesting is that they the Weasleys have a radio in here 
And it is curious to me that, like, it's almost curious to me that Ron doesn't have a radio at school, or none of the boys have a radio that like, is to so listen to Quidditch. Right. Yes. yes. Yeah. They, that is so surprising. Yeah. It's like, I don't know. I don't know what that's about at all. But yeah. So either way, it's like uh, apparently Harry and Ron are spending way too much time trying to figure out like who Nicholas Flamel is, and like, oh, Hagrid's got a dragon. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> In order to be like, hey, what are your general interests? <laughs> yeah. Tell know, me right? about your direct family. Right. But I think there even is a time where like Ron goes off trying to explain the complicated rules of Quidditch or something and it seems like maybe you could have brought up the Chudley Cannons. Yeah. Then. It, it seems like it. It seems like it. Yeah. Um, but speaking of you should talk, there is the really hilarious circumstances under which Harry is in trouble for not even actually doing magic yeah. inside of his own home. Uh, and Ron is saying to him, you know we're not supposed to do spells outside of school, to which Harry says, you should talk. I know, right? Um, <laughs> staring at the floating car. This is like one of those things where it's like, it's again baffling to me that the trace is just so utterly absurd. It is that, so like, absurd. The Enchanted vehicle doesn't count as magic, but someone else performing magic in a house that Harry is known to be in has gotten him like like marked. Oh, I know. It's, yeah. it's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, yeah, Ron says, oh, this doesn't count. It's like, but why not? Because like like it, it, there's this weird loophole where like if you use a magical object, like you're not doing magic, you're just holding something that's magical. So like that doesn't register. But it's like, why, why is that different? You know, right? Yes, like, it's it's like it's it's weird because it's almost like they can detect the ignition point of a magical spell being created, but not the presence of magic. Hard stop. Right. Otherwise, like like could Ron like click the yeah like, like Ron could like click the deluminate like if if Ron as uh whatever twelve year old here clicks the deluminator like that would do something magical like it would be a device that he could pull the light out of right right like that would be that's like the same as casting a spell so for, for all not intents that there's and purposes, a spell that can do that right but so all intents and purposes though he it means he could fly his broomstick with no issues right. broomsticks not he, a problem yeah he could do that he also could I have use more to say about broomsticks in this chapter okay okay yeah. but he could also use his invisibility cloak at home right you yes know? he could like, use the invisibility cloak I, I feel like he could just screw with dudley <laughs> i know yeah. yeah why is it oh my god you're right why is harry not using the cloak at I, home i guess it's all like locked away but like of all the things you like want to like tuck away right away oh i know but actually speaking of being locked away this is one of those like uh, i think it's a really cute nod to arthur weasley that um they come in and of course fred and george and Ron are stuck with the same issue, which is that they also can't do magic during part of this rescue mission. Right. But I love it. the line comes from uh, Fred, who says it's to go and pick the lock with a hairpin. He says a lot of mother, a lot of wizards think it's a waste of time knowing this sort of muggle trip trick. But they feel, uh, but we feel like their skills worth learning, even if they are a bit slow. This is funny to me because I feel like this is Fred and George basically being like, yes, there is benefit to muggle ways of doing things. Yeah. Like, to me, that's like that's like an homage to their dad. Even it absolutely, yeah. Even though they're like sort of making fun of him in this chapter a little bit. Right. Yeah. It's like he, yeah. he, he loves muggle stuff. It's like w we do too. We, yes. learn, we learn muggle tricks. I know. <laughs> and actually there's a really fun little just like thing about the fact that they open the door with like a hairpin because next year Harry does the same thing to open his trunk. So like he does like listen to Fred here like like Fred says it's a skill worth learning and like so Harry does yeah oh yeah like, that's Harry true. does yeah, do it like he takes which it just kind of fun and then the Weasleys continue to do this later on when they open the shop they have like um like muggle card tricks right you know yes like they, do. they like they, there is like a little muggleness about, yeah I think you're right it is like all sort of an homage to their dad yes a little bit I also love when they're walking down the stairs when Harry says watch out for the bottom stair it creaks as if they haven't already ripped a window off the house but it's like <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah no <laughs> That bottom stair, that's what's going to get you caught. Right, you yeah. know? Squeaky stair, I know. But that that is such like kid thinking where it's it's like as a kid, you're you're feeling that like if you were to like sneak down to the kitchen in the middle of the night to get like a snack or something. Yeah. The squeaky <coughs> floorboard does feel like your your like maximum. Yeah, opponent. that's like, yeah. yeah. Oh, but I do this sometimes like I'll like if I go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and I'm like, Whew do I flush or not? Like if I flush it, it could wake somebody up. Oh my gosh. You know? Yes. And, but then like in the morning, like if I have to go wake Luke up for school, I could be in his room being like, Luke, time to get up. Like physically shaking him when he's like mm, dead asleep. Yeah, it's not, like, not you know that, what? Yeah. The toilet's not going to do it. No, I know. But I have the exact same issue because my, my bathroom is on the exact, it shares a wall with my daughter's 
yeah, yeah. Uh, Addison's bedroom. So oh, it's man. like, yeah, it's like, this is way too That's close. a little closer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah indeed. So mm-hmm. anyway, um, <laughs> ba- bathroom conversation aside. Yeah. Um, no, the other thing that I really like though about Fred and George here is just their overall like willingness to help. Like they are, they are so in their element they throughout really this entire are. scene. Yeah. Like they, they pull up and it's just like, all right, Harry <laughs> asked George, like just, just basically like as if you didn't just pull up in the middle of the night in a flying car. Right. Yeah. As, as totally if normal. Completely Whatever. ordinary situation. Yeah. I mean, they, <clears throat> stealthily get in pick two locks and get all of Harry's stuff up the stairs making no noise. Yes. Yes, right. exactly. So it's like I feel like this is another one of those instances uh, and, and I do love that this is included in the story overall because I think that there are tons of kids who go to school that don't thrive in an academic environment, but it is not because they are not smart. Right. It's just like they, they just need to direct their energies towards something that like makes sense to them. I know that is such a constant theme with Fred and George. Yes. Like, I think even in the first book, it says that Ron says like Fred and George goof around a bit, but they still get really good marks and it's like eventually that's not true they just sort of goof around but there's like i think when they're doing like the headless hats or something or maybe it's the vomiting or something i think it's the headless hats and and hermione is even like wow that's an impressive piece of magic oh no we're thinking of different things oh okay okay Okay, i think i think they've perfected one of the um one of the skiving snack box things okay and uh, like fred's you know vomiting into a bucket and then they're like vanishing it and taking the other side and be like i'm fine or whatever. Okay. And Hermione is like, there's no real use to that. And Ron's like, over. like, no use. They've got 26 galleons already. You right. Know? Yes. Like, yeah. Ah. Uh, that, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Th- that's that's a, a prime example of where your priorities are in massively different places. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, so it's like they're um, they're doing it. And then obviously Weasley Wizard Weezes is like the only shop thriving in the middle of the second wizarding war. Right. 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 <laughs> yeah. like, Everybody needs a laugh. Everyone right needs now. a laugh. You know poo. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be murdered in their beds. <laughs> <laughs> oh uh, my god! What an absolutely great one. Uh, let's see. There's also there. There's also there's so Fred and George pick the lock with the hairpin. With them when they get in. Um, well, actually, first of all, I should mention that as Harry's getting in, after he clears out his entire room, apparently what he forgot was Hedwig. I know. Like, I literally wrote next to it, like, excuse me. I literally wrote next to it in all caps, how? I, I know. <laughs> like, they're like, get her out, like, get all my wizard stuff from under the stairs. I'll get all my stuff in my room. All of your stuff is basically all your wizard stuff, Harry. So, like, what did you grab? Right, Like, right. what did you put in there? And you forgot your, your like, only friend in the house? Uh, like, are you kidding me? This this is this is every time I leave a hotel room ever and I'm like I'm like looking under the bed I'm like like I'm like like you know yeah surveying the entire space in front of me like okay I am not looking at any left like electronics or socks or you know this that or the others and the thing I always end up leaving is like face wash in the bathroom yeah because it's like you know you'll open the bathroom door and you poke your head and you're like okay like, so what am I missing no I'm all good but you you left it like inside of the shower door yeah like, that's the problem well but Hedberg you, I think is pretty obvious in that room yeah I, I completely otherwise empty room you know no no nothing going on you got yeah. a, you got a caged bird you forgot <laughs> i know a giant <laughs> caged bird in there but i guess that's what wakes up uncle vernon so you can have a little bit of suspense as harry escapes there's also a line here where they're hanging outside of the window where harry's like they have locked me up tell them at hogwarts i want to come back and it's like harry like I love that there's like this part of Harry's brain where like he doesn't realize they're there to like take him away. Right, right, <laughs> yeah. right. It's like <laughs> like they're gonna show up and be like, "Hey, see ya." <laughs> Best case scenario, I got to send a message with those guys who arrived in the right. flying car. Like, no, you're coming with us right now. Right now, yeah. It's yeah. like it just like I think it just speaks like how helpless Harry feels uh, at Privet Drive at that moment that he doesn't even think like rescue is possible. Oh, I totally agree. Yeah, I totally agree. Oh, so actually, when they get in the car, though, they hand Hedwig's cage to Ron and he also um, unlocks it with the hairpin. So like even though Fred and George are like we think their skills worth learning like Ron can also already do it. Is that right? Yeah, George handed the hairpin to Ron and a moment later Hedwig soared joyfully out of the window to Dang. glide along them like a ghost. You're totally right. Yep. You were totally right. How about that? I that was like one of those things that I must have just like glazed right over because I was like, no, I'm pretty sure George did it. And I was yeah. like, no, it says it right there. Okay, yeah. So Ron Ron is also able to do the hairpin trick, which is pretty cool. Given given some some creds to Ron there, who so so infrequently <coughs> seems to to have any credits. I know, that, like, like all the skills. You yeah. have to be good at, at chess in book one, okay? Like that's that's achievement enough for Ron That's ever it. again. <laughs> Done. Right. Maybe eventually he'll be like reasonably good at Quidditch when he's under the placebo effect of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> drugs. Of drugs. <laughs> exactly. Um, then there's so Harry starts telling them about Dobby and the fiasco with the pudding and uh, they're all sort of 
Let's see. George says, so he wouldn't even tell you who's supposed to be plotting all the stuff. And Harry says, I don't think he could. And like that to me is such an interesting line because it's like the line between what Dobby can and can't do like seems very blurry. It like, definitely does. Like, yeah. I, it's like I don't think he could like you couldn't tell him who's going to do it, but you can leave the Malfoys and come give him some version of a warning. Like, why, why can you go this far, but not that far? The, this is, I mean, I think it again kind of goes like to what we, we, I think last chapter we compared it a little bit to like Creature when Sirius Black like yells at him to like get out. Yeah. And, and like Creature is able to be like, okay. Yep. And it's like by getting out, you basically gave him permission to like leave premises. So that it's like all I can imagine in my head is that that has got to be what is going on with Dobby is that he has found like some loophole where like one of the Malfoys said something that was like close enough. Yeah. Because it does, it does feel like um, when it comes to like this, like relationship with the house elves, it's like, like if, if they so desire to defy you, it's all a matter of de- like finding the, the, the split hairs, Yeah, which I suspect if they are bound by uh, these commands, those split hairs are, are pretty obvious to them. Yeah. Like they can probably see like the openings where they exist. Yeah. So uh, I, th- it probably it feels like one of those things where you'd have to be, you know, if if this is an engagement you found yourself inside of at all, you'd have to be very careful all the time about how you went about asking. Yeah. Well, this is also why like I, it seems like a lot of the house elves just like really like to do work. Yeah. 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 And so it's like maybe if you just it seems like if you treat them well, they probably aren't looking for the loopholes. But obviously the Malfoys are pretty terrible. It's yeah. So, it seems yeah. like in in general that's about the relationship that creature had with. Um, Sirius's mother versus Sirius himself. Yeah, yeah right. That's, exactly. That's the difference. Exactly. Um, uh, but so there's immediately um, they try and throw you off the scent of like Dobby's warning with Fred and George just trying to be like, oh, it's probably just someone joking around with you. Anyone who hates you like, yes, you know. which I also found to be very interesting because they're basically like coming up with exactly the right answer. It's like like literally with one guess, they correctly land on the Malfoys being the potential owner of Dobby of Dobby, and which it, it's like the Malfoys did not send Dobby and like Draco had nothing to do with it, but he does belong to Draco. Yes, exactly. So it's yeah. like it's amazing that they're right for the wrong reasons. In, yeah, in this particular case, but then they say um, this is interesting. The, so there's a very interesting line here too, where Harry says Draco Malfoy. He hates me and George turns around and says Draco Malfoy, not Lucius Malfoy son which to me is interesting because it means that like in Fred and George, like in, throughout Harry's first year, Fred and George took zero notice of Draco at all. They're like, who? Never yeah. heard of him. Right, 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 right. Yes, and and this is another one where I feel like we see, um, I, I think, do we eventually see it be the case that Ginny is dating like Dean Thomas and Fred and George ask like, are you or are you not going out with a boy called Dean Thomas? Yeah, and it's like, like one of those things where it's like, surely you know Dean, right? Like there are, you know, you know, there's there between between your ages at yeah. present, you're talking about a grand total of like probably fifteen to twenty boys. Like, right? That is not too many boys to where you've never crossed paths in the dormitory. I before. know, like they're one year below you. Like certainly you know who Dean is, or maybe not. I've, whenever I've read that line, yeah, I always think they're like. I, I've always read that as if they were like phrasing it in a comical way, like like specifically like are you are you like I don't know like like if they were asking like if they, it's like if it was Harry or something like if they were asking Ginny about that be like are you or are you not dating a boy named Harry Potter? Ah, uh, that's you know? a good point. Yeah, maybe like, it's maybe it's the inflection. Like, right, maybe it's the inflection. Like delivery. like as if we don't know, <laughs> 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 we've never <laughs> heard of him. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes. Um. But uh. So I don't I don't know. But. Yeah, it's it is interesting. There's also that, and then even in the DA, I think like when, again with Ginny, when he, Ron finds out she's dating Michael Corner, he's like, "Which one was he?" And it's like, dude, you're all you don't even know everyone in the DA. Like he's there, right? Right? Yeah. right yes, you would definitely know who who this particular. <laughs> yeah, person you're in is. a pretty small group there in short supply. But yep. Harry's response is, "Must be. It's not a very common name, is it?" And, which I just wrote like, "How would you know? <laughs> How do you know Malfoy's not a common name?" It could be. It could, could be. be. It could be a common name. You just know the one. How many kids do you know? Right. But either way, yeah. they, they immediately narrow in on him. Um, they also we get our, our first reference to Lucius either which yes. way, which I also just think is kind of interesting. That's because Lucius is his name coming up so early is good setup for the fact that like we will see him 
again at the bookstore and then again learn eventually that like the diary was planted yep. you know by like, him like most of the plot is put in motion by him yes exactly yeah. so the, I, I think the early inclusion is is no mistake this is sort of like like <coughs> us getting that first little like like hey we're, we're preparing you for this to be a yeah, character for the that, other characters in the story the same yeah. thing is going to happen with Lockhart later in this chapter chapter you're exactly correct as well yep, yep definitely um, then there's also um, Fred and George saying Lucius Malfoy came back saying he never met any of it load of dung dad reckons he was right and you know who's inner circle and it's just like spot on yep 100%. <laughs> totally yep get that um, da, 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 da. they also mentioned the ghoul in the attic here for the first time I think yep okay uh, which is just sort of like good setup for later on when they pretend to do this Patergroit thing in book seven um, there's also this is a weird line I thought it said yeah mom's always wishing you had a house elf to do the ironing I was just like what like you can't iron by magic right it, it also this is another one of those instances as well where it's like it seems like the one exception to tasks that house elves can do is like anything to do with laundry because that would wouldn't that be presenting them with uh, right yes with, like with also clothing. also yeah specifically something house elves shouldn't be doing right 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, unless unless that like line is like Unless the presentation, and it's hard to say because obviously, like Lucius doesn't intend to give Davi the sock. Right. Yeah. He know? just sort so of th- like, yeah. He doesn't even like hand it to him as like hold this. He just like th- the fact that he was holding it and then Dobby is holding it is enough. It's amazing that any house elf relationships have stayed intact for any amount of time at all because it just seems like there would be so many instances where something would <laughs> something would just cause it to like, like the relationship to be like broken. Yeah. Just, like it just seems like yeah. Like, especially because when I think of the chores at my house like laundry is like, like top of the list. Yeah. Like yeah. what are they do it especially because they can do magic like uh, again the ironing of the pants like like i there's no way you can't magically iron something yeah like you know especially with mrs weasley who in this chapter will do like household like non-verbal household magic yes yes indeed yes (laughs) we 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 know that we know that she's definitely pretty pretty capable with that so um anyway but yeah so then let's see as we then move forward yeah we get the the um the reference to Hermes, which I think is, is that a setup at all? Uh, yeah. Okay. There, there we go. Yeah. When he was made per, a prefect, that's another one of those things where we know that like the, the Weasleys do sort of have like the special occasion inside of the family where uh, if you make prefix status, that, that sort of comes with uh, the presentation yep. of like a gift of sorts. Um, yeah. But then they also, the next line is, but Percy wouldn't lend him to me, said Ron, said he needed him. Percy has been acting very oddly this summer, said George frowning. And this, this to me is like, this is the first line in the book where they're trying to set you the reader up to think of Percy as like the red hair or well, it's the first time they're setting you up for Percy to, to suspect Percy. Yes. Later on. You're exactly correct. Yep. And and that's, uh, th- you know, it's funny because I, I literally um, uh, like part of me wrote down like a little scribble note here because we do have a theory about Percy that upon his graduation from Hogwarts school that he uh, basically is under the imperious curse for quite a period of time mm-hmm. and that's like part of like what has got him like marching <coughs> to the tune of like the ministry's right you know drum, drum. so aggressively um, but you're you're definitely correct like this is this is like one of those things where we know that throughout the book Percy is going to continuously show up in sort of like unusual uh, circumstances or places or he's he's like somewhere maybe that he's not supposed to be or you know is being secretive with Ginny or Ginny knows a secret about him that he's like that you know isn't isn't meant to be be shared and right um you know there's all these things and and obviously what we'll what we'll what we'll know as the story unfolds is that percy has a girlfriend right which um, one means that he's already dating penelope which is kind of the, which is you know kind of cool i guess y- yeah uh, and, and of course so the the actual reason why he's acting very oddly this summer is because he's probably corresponding with his with his girlfriend. yeah that's exactly what that's yeah. who he's sending all the letters to yeah. it's interesting that he's like so secretive about this piece of information though like like, why are you so ashamed of having a girlfriend? <laughs> I, I don't <laughs> you know? know. Yeah, this this does seem like a strange one, um, especially because, like, if anything, it seems like something that, like, y- your family would be, like, excited for you or impressed by. Or I know. You know well, like, I mean, I think I think at the end when Ginny finally tells Fred and George, they're, like, so happy. Like, Christmas came early. Oh, my God. Percy has a girlfriend. We're going to, like, make fun of him? Like, for for what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't, for what? Is this a make for fun what? Of- <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't get it. Also, it seems weird to be that he's so secretive about it and is in Gryffindor because you know it just seems like the sort of thing you'd have the courage to wear proudly maybe so maybe so I'm 
I'm trying to go back in my mind and like to to high school versions of us and and try to figure out whether or not like any amount of entering into those first you know early relationships was something that like one of us would have kept secret. I mean, I guess there is. When I think about it like that, I suppose there is. Like, it, it's not like I came home and was like, "Guess what, mom?" Yeah, <laughs> <You know? laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, or like you know, it feels like the type of thing. The first time you would like bring it up at the table and be like, "Oh yeah, I started dating so and so." Like, like someone's spoon would drop. I'm like, "Wait, what?" Wait, single, single, what? Did you just say girlfriend? <laughs> I know. Yeah. So I don't know. May, maybe there's something to it, yeah, but yeah, maybe well, ashamed is the wrong word. Just sort of like, yeah, it's just new private, for him. Private. Private. Yeah. That's we'll, the right. Well, that's the word. We'll lay off Percy. We'll lay off Percy. There you He's go. A, yeah, you you have, enjoy be plenty to complain about later. Yeah, you en- you enjoy your privacy for now. Yes. Um, <clears throat> okay. So here we go. Now we get to start. They start talking about Arthur's job at the ministry. He works in the most boring department, said Ron, the misuse of Muggle artifacts office. Right. Okay. So and it says it all. It all. It's all to do with bewitching things that are Muggle made. You know, in case they end up back in a Muggle shop or house, which like. To me, this is a very interesting, like, what counts as this? Because, like, broomsticks are muggle-made, right? Like, they're bewitched to fly, you know? Do you, do you think the broomsticks that they fly in Quidditch are, like, muggle broomsticks? Well, that's are- what I mean. Like, that's, that, so that, that is kind of the question. I'm not, like, do you, but, like, if muggles invented brooms and then wizards were like, we could fly on those and they enchanted them to fly, would that not then be, like, exactly this, bewitching things that are muggle-made? I guess so, but I, I have always sort of assumed that that all of the wizarding broomsticks are specifically made by wizards and enchanted. Like, like in, in, I think we've even made a video once upon a time that talked about whether or not broomsticks have cores. Yeah. Um, to which I think the ultimate argument that we made is that they do or that they would. Because huh. yeah, we did make that argument. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, like what I come back to with it is that like they they say like with a wand, for example, like you could technically channel your magic through any any object. You know, yeah. so you could you could hold up a rubber chicken, and you know, if you were to cast Lumos, like you know, if you were a super powerful wizard, you might get like a faint light to come out of the like the right. end of it. And right. then if you were to give them like. Uh, like a stick matching their own wand would, it's like maybe it would be even a, a little, little bit better, better still than yeah. if it was the right length, it would be a little bit better still. But like nothing's going to be better until you add that magical component to the center of it. So in my mind, it's almost like, could you, you know, a la Hocus Pocus fly um, like, a, like, a, like a vacuum cleaner you right, know, or something yeah. like that in the same capacity? And it's like probably, but not well. Um, so it's like you need to do something to it to make it inherently no doubt like Quidditch brooms and wizard brooms are better but th- th- I guess yeah it does bring like a weird question like are brooms innately is it like could could a wizard go pick up like a muggle broom and like fly on it yeah yeah exactly <coughs> like that's right. that's the big question yeah it's like, in, in my mind it's like I would say it, it feels like the kind of thing where it would be like like maybe the the equivalent of like jumping off of uh, like a high place with like an umbrella you know where it's like you want to marry Poppins and like gently oh, right, glide yeah. to the ground. <laughs> it won't work. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it's like I would be willing to bet that if you could get like um like all the proper scientific testing materials, the umbrella is slowing your fall some, but not enough to safely make you like right. land on the ground. You know, right. like like it has more wind resistance than if you jumped without it. Um, yeah, you know, so in in my mind, I feel like that that would be like how like a like a broomstick might be. It's like you're never gonna get, like fly up and and play a game of Quidditch. Oh yeah, no, on, on like a like a like a plastic broom from Walmart. Right, exactly. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> could could you technically maybe get it to levitate more than 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 nothing? Maybe, maybe because that but that that's the question because like it other like brooms are almost certainly a Muggle invention, and so. If they can fly, if if no matter what any broom at all could be flown by any wizard, then it is not a matter of bewitching magical objects. It's just that brooms are innately magical. Right. Right. Yeah. So th- I feel like the fact that brooms don't fall under, or maybe obviously just because of wizarding culture, brooms don't because they're just like, yeah, we know about broomsticks. Like this is just a normal thing sure. for our culture. Yeah, yeah. But there's other things in this very chapter, like radios. Do they not get, like? Are, is the do you think the radio they have? Is like magically enchanted in any way? Oh, that's a good question, right? Because certainly that's a Muggle artifact. Wizards didn't invent radios. <laughs> I have I have a counterpoint to you yeah? okay. that I, that I think could be kind of interesting for this exact discussion. Okay, which is that the very thing that uh, the ultimate irony for him to work at this particular misuse of Muggle artifact artifacts office and the fact that it has to do with bewitching things that are Muggle made, <laughs> like is that 
what they drove was a, a a flying car that was a muggle artifact that was bewitched by Arthur himself. And yeah. Fred and George point out, it says if he raided our house, he'd have to put himself under arrest. But Arthur's ability to make the car fly is strictly magical. Yeah. Like he is not, do, he has not done anything to it that has, that has anything to do with like, uh, like aeronautical engineering. Yeah. Because we also know later in the story, his deepest ambition is to learn how airplanes stay right. in the yeah. air. Like he doesn't know how it happens. Right. Despite the fact that he has literally created right. a flying vehicle. Right. He has done nothing, nothing to do with the physics or aerodynamics of flight right. to the car. He has done nothing but magic to the car. Yes, exactly. So he he has like an incantation, a levitation <clears throat> uh, spell placed upon the vehicle that allows it to fly, which achieves the same function as what an airplane is providing for muggle people. Right. So when he wants to know how an airplane flies, like stays in the air, it's like what he wants to know is the actual muggle engineering that allows for like the aerodynamics to like work. Right. Like how is this actually... How is this actually happening? Uh, which, if you were to take that piece of logic and apply it back to your radio question, it would almost suggest to me that uh, wizard radios are not using like traditional radio waves. I, yes, exactly. Right? Like, they are, they like, can't be. They can't be. Like yeah. they they have to be using some type of like like magical transmission of spoken word. Right. That is exactly how I feel like it works as well because the other thing well maybe th this is now we're gonna i'm gonna run into a weird thing so not, we mentioned earlier that none of the none of the students at hogwarts ever have like a radio to listen to the quidditch matches or whatever or right. anything and I, it occurred to me as i was saying that well they say like technology doesn't work at hogwarts because there's like too much magic in the air sure so like maybe that could be part of it but if they're wizard radios then and they are not powered by like broadcast waves they're just like magically connected to one another that doesn't seem like it'd be a problem that's right? true as well in which case then it's just weird that no one has a radio again which i guess is just plausible that they just don't have one but right but right um there there's more ben like what about the clocks at the weasleys certainly clocks are muggle inventions right? well but but uh, but again like you know the thing that we know this particular clock to do are things that are that are not typical of clocks they're not necessarily like telling uh they're not telling the time they're telling like tasks yeah or locations so again it's like i don't know if they have like your classic uh in fact i would argue they don't have your classic like like gears and and right all maybe the, not the associated maybe bits. i mean you're right they're not telling time they're more it's calling them a clock is almost just like maybe you're right so like it's not really a clock it's like you call it a clock because it looks like a clock but it's really more like a like a, a i don't know what i don't know what to call it but like uh uh, a reference of sorts. Yes. Like an, yeah. It, yeah, you're right. Like it seems like like if you were to get into like an actual airplane, there's a whole bunch of instruments, all of which share the same like shape and have needles in the same way that like a clock has like pointing hands and right. stuff like that. But there, it's like, you know, your gas gauge in your vehicle is not telling you the speed of the car, nor is it telling you the time of day. Sure. So um, they like different objects in that regard. But you're right. We are still calling them clocks. They're still calling them clocks. I and mean, there's like a weird thing here too where they mention Harry mentions one clock, but it's like the Weasleys actually have two very unique magical clocks. They do indeed. They do. Which, which, which is, I, it was, this is another thing where I thought for sure the clock that he saw in this <sighs> chapter was going to be the the clock, like the mortal peril. The mortal peril clock. The dentist. Like where are like, they? Yeah. yeah, like all those types of things. But it's not that one. This is more like when to do other like household, like time to feed the chickens, you're late. Which the you're late feels, I don't know. Yeah. It's more like a calendar clock or something. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's more like a calendar clock. So anyway, yeah. anyway, so the, mis misuse of muggle well, artifacts. OK, so here's the other thing. Apparently, Arthur would be in trouble for having bewitching this car to do things. But later on, Harry gets picked up by cars from the ministry that are also magically enhanced. This is also right. True. This is also <laughs> are true. those not illegal cars? <laughs> well, I, I mean, they because you know what? Arthur enchanted them, but didn't intend to use them. These the ones by the ministry are enchanted and obviously intended for use because they're using them. <laughs> it seems to me, though, that the things th the way that Arthur spends his time is not necessarily just the the uh, modification of a muggle object hard stop. It's more the modification and then the like the implantation yeah, with like malicious intent or exactly something. Yeah. yeah yeah like this this is like one of those things where it's like it only really becomes a crime if what you have done has then gone and like harmed muggles right you know sure. and, and that's like where you've got the um 
squirted like the teapot that went berserk and squirted boiling tea all over the place. Then one man ended up in the hospital with sugar tongs clamped like clamped to his nose. Yeah, like, these are clearly instances where somebody did something. They made it to muggles and then they like wreaked havoc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so anyway, we'll move on from that. I just think it's funny that this is the mis- like apparently you're not supposed to like tamper with muggle things, but there's like all sorts of examples of them doing it. Yes, in more in like completely acceptable legal ways. So maybe that's just the case. Yeah. Um, they also mentioned that Dad only works with one other person named uh, an old warlock called Perkins, <laughs> which Perkins is the one who gives them the tent, which they use in Deathly Hallows when they're doing the Horcrux hunt. But my real question here is like, what what is the what is what makes you a warlock versus a wizard? Like, what is the delineation? I, I I don't know. That was something I marked as well, and I was kind of curious. I was like, why? Yeah. What is uh, like? I, I don't know if I I don't know if I totally uh, know like what the the difference is. Is is there like like is a warlock somebody who is like who sits on the wizengamot? There is like there is like um like chief, like chief warlock. warlock of the wizengamot. Yes. Yeah. Like like I wonder if like if an old warlock would almost be like like this is somebody who had formerly been like a senator but is now right is it like like esquire or something or doctor like or, or, you yeah, like earned yeah, yeah. Like, like a degree and now you're like a warlock right like it's, it's like a title that like references like a former position that you that you like held as, right yeah maybe as that's like an it. important official i, I okay. think that that to me that's what, like that's what it would say because like chief warlock would say that you were like the like like chief senator yeah. in this particular case. Like you were yeah. the lead person right. of, of the okay. other elected officials. So now he's just sort of like whatever he whatever his warlock days are behind him and now he's just working in this two man office of the ministry. Yes, yeah, yeah. He's All just right. his passion project. Yeah, this yeah. is just what he does now. Yeah. Just, just Perkins were between camping trips. Yeah, that's exactly um, right. There's also the there's where Arthur says he went on nine raids last night, and it's like that to me is also kind of funny where like because I guess that to me means he showed up at like nine different houses to like inspect their stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But in the middle of the night, like why isn't this his job during why like in the middle of the day? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, it says dad was working overtime for weeks. Uh, well, no, I guess that was in reference to to uh, the, the tea set that was once sold. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know because it, it does seem like he must work. He must work nights, but it doesn't seem like you'd be able to go and just be like and like knocking on people's door at three in the morning and be like, Hey, sorry to bother you guys. Do you have a teapot? Right. We got a like gonna, even the word raid makes it sound like, you know, I'm imagining like a SWAT team or something. You I know. know. Yeah. Like yeah, Arthur like, Weas is like, all right, here we go. Perkins. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Break Se- down the door. Secret agent. <laughs> Surprise. <Perkins. laughs> We're here to look for muggle things. I know. It does seem like bo- like the most like uh, like super cool mm. espionage while also like incredibly nerdy, goofy right. squadron of two people ever. I know. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I <laughs> just his job doesn't just seems like your job it sounds like so much easier to do during the day and it doesn't have to be done at night. You're exactly right. I agree yeah. with that. Yeah. So <laughs> I have I, I just have no idea. Maybe people just keep strange hours in the wizarding world. I guess it's possible yeah. for sure. Um anyway, so uh we we're uh as we as we continue to move along here though, we learned that they are uh in a town called Ottery Saint Catchpole. Mm-hmm. Um which is just like one of those, you know, bits of detail that I always feel like is, is a good one to remember for all future trivia endeavors. I, know. I think there is there is a real town called Otterton. Otterton, okay. I think it is that it is based on similar. And then I think near Otterton is a town called Chudley, which is spelled C H U D L E I G H. Okay, so it makes sense that that Ron is a fan of the Chudley cannons. The Chudley cannons, yeah. Okay. The Chudley cannons, Chudley cannons. Boom, boom, boom. boom we, we are, are not pirates. pirates. Wow. If you understood that reference, then please leave your favorite sports ball emoji in the comments. <laughs> there we go. That's exactly it. Um, let's see here. The other thing that I found to be kind of interesting. Um, well, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna give one other piece of trivia because I know I've gotten it wrong in a J versus Ben before. Uh, but as they as they land, uh, Fred says touchdown. And then Harry looks up uh, and it says it looked as though it had once been a large stone pig pen, um, which this is a question that I remember getting wrong in a J versus Ben once. And I was like, I was like, there is no way in the world <laughs> that they were ref- that they referred to the Weasley's house as a pig pen. Yeah, I was like, that seems so like offensive. Maybe. I don't, yeah, I know. I'm like, uh, maybe I just don't know what old pig pens looked like like were they really like like house sized in foundation or something possibly but like yeah. when you read it in context it seems to play a lot better um like it seems a lot less like filthy or something you know yeah. like like it's not it's not like saying like yeah their house looks like a pig pen like that sounds like the type of thing like 
Draco would say, like, yeah, like oh, I thought you lived in a pig pen, Weasley. Like, right, you know, like very like some <laughs> maybe he does say that. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it's like well, crap. Now Harry thought the exact same thing. Ugh. Oh man. Anyway, so the house apparently looked like a large. It had been a large stone pig pen, but doesn't anymore because it has extra rooms added here and there until it's several stories high and super crooked looking. The thing that I found to be kind of interesting is just simply the fact that it has a sign that like their home is named. Yeah. Um. You know, I don't know if this is something that might be more common. Um, like, you know, for farm like properties in general. Um, but like yeah. certainly like our house is doesn't have a name. Right. Yeah, it know? doesn't yeah, I know what you mean. But then like or may, I wonder if it's like a wizarding like culture thing because like when uh, like Bill and Flora's house it, it's like called Shell Cottage. It is called Shell you know, Cottage. Like they yeah. have a name for where they live. Which I guess and, like, that makes Malfoy sense. Malfoy Manor is kind of a name, you know, right. it's really, you know, not creative or anything. Yeah, and I that, that actually I don't I don't hate that as a, as an explanation because I think that the mail system is so different because you're not you don't have a carrier that's going down streets um you know like you uh, you would just be sending an owl to a known property yeah so i could see that maybe, yeah or like grimald place right, right? yeah also yep. just sort of a name is that a name place or is the street like grimald like it's like number 13 is it number 13 grimald place number 12 number 12 sorry yeah. oh yeah. god wow yeah my yeah. bad <laughs> how embarrassing wow. did you think turquoise was purple <laughs> wow <laughs> number 12 grimald yeah yeah so yeah maybe it's just like a wizarding thing to have like your homes have a name yeah I, okay yeah. i'm starting to think that that totally makes sense and even i think in the case of number 12 it makes sense because the muggles believe that there was an error made in the, like the, the postal system or whatever. Right. so like it's it's not even like number 12 compared to like number 13 grimwald place another wizarding residence right it's like the number 12 is almost part of like the iconic nature of, of the house of yeah. the house because yeah. it was like built in the middle of a muggle establishment right or, right yeah what, what's mildly ironic about it not being 13 though is that oftentimes like hotels don't have a f- number floor 13 just yeah. for basic superstition purposes oh that would have been that would have been great if it was the number 13 yes yeah it was exactly. like oh yeah yeah for superstitious purposes there's no reason we just skip 13 on the P- street people assume it's unlucky or something yeah. you know and it's like nah but it's not it's a safe haven yes you know? i also like the name the burrow because like Weasels live in burrows. Yeah, you know? I know, that's a good yeah, one. Right. Yeah, I, I highlighted it too. That's yeah. a good one. Also, I don't know why there are. It says <laughs> there were four or five. I guess Harry just couldn't be bothered to count for sure. Um, chimneys perched on top of the red roof, and I'm like, why? <laughs> why do you have five chimneys? I did not realize the fact that it says four or five because it doesn't seem hard to look at something and discern <laughs> the difference between four and five of something. Four or five. Four. It's like hard it's to like, say. It's like four, maybe five. It? It's like we're looking at it right, <laughs> right now. You're there. Yeah. But also, why? Why would you have so many chimneys? Possibly just because of the, the location in the fireplaces. Uh, like if but you wanted to have one, like what? What? How many rooms in the house have a fireplace? Well, if you don't have like central air or something, I don't know. Maybe it gets cold. I guess. Golden fires. I don't know. I mean, I feel like if you, I guess I don't maybe, know. Maybe maybe every little room's got its own little tiny every, fireplace. Maybe I would love that. I would love it if every like bedroom in the house had a fireplace. I love. Nothing. Although then is this is then the, is it enough fireplaces for every room to have one? It seems like Ron's doesn't. Yeah, because that would have been mentioned. But, but you then, can sometimes share a fireplace based yeah. on the positioning. Like you could have like two two um, fireplaces vent into the same chimney. Is what I. I mean. suppose yeah. that's true. Yeah, yeah I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm I'm extremely pro wood burning fireplaces. Oh, so I, am I. There, there's nothing cozier. So there's not. It seems like a cozy thing. It's just that it's never mm-hmm. mentioned that there are multiple fireplaces in the borough, even though they have five chimneys. Sure enough. Sure enough. Yeah. Um, okay. Either which way. <laughs> yeah. uh, then uh, as we as we trudge forward here, we get the line from Fred that says, "Now we'll go upstairs really quickly and wait for Mom to call for breakfast. Then Ron, you come down and stare downstairs, going, Mom, look who turned up in the middle of the night, and she'll be all pleased to see Harry." And will ever even know we flew the car. Oh, yeah. I was like, this is such a like child's version of a plan. Oh, I know. <laughs> I literally wrote down next to it just, oh, yeah, good plan. <laughs> <laughs> That'll work. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. No other questions need to be asked whatsoever. Yes. Um, then we get just one of the best descriptions ever of Mrs. Weasley was marching across the yard scattering chickens <laughs> and for a short, plump, kind-faced woman, it was remarkable how much she looked like a saber-toothed tiger. <laughs> ah, said Fred. Ah. <laughs> She's on to us. Oh, man. And then I love their response. Morning, mom. 
<laughs> says George in what he thought was a clearly jaunty winning voice. Like, I can smooth this over. Don't worry. <laughs> no big deal. Yeah. Well, we were Maybe just- she doesn't know. <laughs> we can't assume anything. Give nothing away. Blind optimism. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah, I love that whole exchange. Uh, fantastic. Uh, then there's another line down here. It says you could do it with taking a leaf out of Percy's book, which one gross, but two that's more misdirection, I think, towards Percy. Yeah, he hasn't even actually appeared yet. No, he has not. Yep, yep not at all. Yep. Um, let's see. Uh, then of course, uh, let's see. Sorry, lost my <laughs> lost my train of thinking. Uh, I like the next line when she talks. So she's just screaming at the twins and Ron. And then I love how she just turns to Harry. It's like, I'm very pleased to see you, Harry, dear. Come in, have some breakfast. I know. Th- this is a scene that I feel like plays exactly perfectly, exactly as it should in the film. Yes. It's like it's like she's so clearly so upset with her kids. But then also it's like, oh, Harry, how are you? Yes, like, right. Like, I'm not mad at you at all. I know you I know you had nothing to do with this. Yes, yes, indeed. Right. Like, like she's still extremely aware of Harry's situation. And she's not mad that he's there. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Right, right. Yes. Yeah. It's just the methodology that they, uh, yeah. that they took, um, which to be fair, Mrs. Weasley herself says, like, I don't know what you were thinking, like taking the, the car like we ourselves were thinking about just going and getting him anyway. So it's like she has. Yeah, it's de- it's definitely not like the the collection from the Dursley's hard stop like that. That is something she, she like fully would have signed off on. It's, right. it's just the way they went about doing it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, do you know what if it only, maybe it sounds like a, a communication problem in the family. Like maybe if they just told Ron, you know what? If you don't hear from Harry by Friday, we're going to get him. Exactly. You exactly. know, your dad's going to bust down the door with Perkins. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Secret agent <Yeah>. Perkins. <laughs> <laughs> He's back. Um, oh, uh, when we go inside though, we see are we we get to see um, the uh, that Mrs. Weasley is listening to on her wizarding uh, wireless Celestina Warback. Celestina Warback, which was another one of those where I was like, I did not know that Celestina was introduced so early mm-hmm. in this in this s- I series. I love I love Celestina Warback as this like recurring musician that Mrs. Weasley is a fan of. Yes, exactly. In, in such a light way here too. So it's like it's not even like a plot point, but it does continue to come up as as we press forward uh, with a, a, a cauldron of hot strong love. I know. Do you? <laughs> suppose that she because she's called a singing sorceress so do you suppose she had some sort of degree as well for a warlock <laughs> <laughs> the singing what? sorceress or is it just sort of like yeah you can call any wizard a sorceress we just normally say wizard i think that's exactly yeah it. yeah I all know, right that's, all that's, right that's how i would read that one yeah um let's see here i there there is once again i mean hagrid also had sausages um when he collected harry from the hut on the rock with the dursleys yeah and i don't know what it is about these wizarding sausages but every single time that they're eating sausages in this book i'm like i could go for a sausage i could go for a sausage because i feel like it's like a real sausage it's not like it's not like a kroger bot sausage that you microwaved up it feels like that man it sounds so tasty it does also i think it is no mistake at all that the word um tipping eight the word tipping is used for eight or nine sausages because the um, in the, I think it was the last chapter Harry tips the soup can of vegetables onto Hedwig's cage and it's like ah this is the exact opposite yes yeah. it is no yeah. I, I agree with you 100% I caught the exact same thing I was yeah. like it's so interesting that they use that exact phrasing yeah um, so back to back because yeah. basically this is Harry having yeah eight or nine I mean I don't know the size of these sausages but I'm assuming big I know I agree yeah. I agree yeah like definitely oversized um, it's it seems like quite the feast he's about to have with with his also three fried eggs three fried eggs absolutely <laughs> there's also the um the comparison between how mrs weasley uses a frying pan versus petunia who if you recall swung it at harry <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> earlier in this very book yep uh, yep like mrs yeah petunia tries to just like assault harry with the frying pan and mrs weasley is serving him eight or nine sausages from the frying pan so I think that's another uh, just interesting comparison there. Yep. We've had two frying pan mentions here and vastly different results. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Um, We also have the um, deliverance of Ginny into the conversation Mm -hmm. as she has come down the stairs with no knowledge that the man that she will someday marry uh, (laughs) will be in the kitchen waiting for her. Yeah. Um, That's what I I said. Oh, they get married. (laughs) Oh, yeah. That's so adorable. Yeah. Um, Yeah. But I love that. Ginny said Ron in the undertone to Harry. My sister, she's been talking about you all summer. 
once again, probably just making Ron feel terrible for the fact that his best friend won't seem to write him back for some reason. I know, right? Um, let's see. Then we get. Oh, we skip charm your own cheese. Oh, oh how could we have done it? Okay, wow. let's go so back. this is yeah. Harry's looking around the burrow, noticing the books. One of which is called Charm Your Own Cheese. Which I, ju- I mean, my note here was just I so wish that charmed cheese was more of a recurring thing in these books. That would have been great. I just think it's such a funny thing. Like, what are you doing to the cheese? Like, I know. What what magical effect can you add to cheese uh, well this is this is my my favorite cheese personally is the ch- it's like it's like a it's aged in such a way that there's like little crystals inside of it yes that kind of give it this mm-hmm. like i can't even call it a crunch but it's like it's a it's texture. texture it's yeah. a texture yeah well okay now wait do you think when it says charm your own cheese i my initial read was that you already have cheese and now you are charming it yeah, like to, to to take the cheese. Okay, are you about to say this is Muggle purchased cheese? No, that no, is, I'm not. Is this a misuse of Muggle artifacts? No, it's not. No, cheese is not a Muggle artifact. Okay. It's just food. Or or is this or is the book suggest or is the book saying that like here is a charm to create your own cheese? I I I I, my, like, I think got my, some milk. I, charm it into cheese. That's my interpretation. Oh no, I definitely like the idea that you've got cheese and you're like, well, Parmesan, prepare <laughs> to taste like raspberries or something. <laughs> This is making me desperately on the on the coffee website wanting to carry um, cheese, charm cheeses. Oh my gosh, that would be um, dude. We should talk to someone about carrying cheese because right now what we're carrying, and I'm just gonna hard stop into an ad here, is some wizarding candles. <gasps> Gas. What as of uh, this month, which is now February, actually as of the day this is coming out, it's my birthday. Hey, happy Here. birthday, Jay! Thank Aww. you so much. How yes, great. yes, so fun. Um. But we have our uh, second candle of the year uh, live now, which is called a love potion it for Valentine's Day. Very exciting. Yes. yes. As, so we, we yeah, the Wizard and Candles, if you go to wizardandcandles.com, we have an entire year long for the year of 2024 subscription to candles, all of which will have their own unique uh, sort of like styles and scents. And inside of each one is also a hidden charm yes. that is unique to each candle. So not cheese, uh, not cheese. No but cheese. we should have a cheese charm in one of them now that I think about oh, it. That wouldn't be that would yeah. not be the worst. The, be the, the worst. charm cheese candle. Yeah, the charm. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> that should just be a standalone product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it smells like, like cheese. It smells just like cheese. I don't know if anyone wants that. <laughs> <laughs> you guys want my cheese candle? We could do like a little play on the Lockhart. Like it's just like magic. Like, yeah. it smells just like cheese. It's just like cheese. Yeah. Gotta, yeah, you gotta well, charm well, your cheese. But I promise you, at, at present we don't have any uh, cheese scented candles. No, but we, we do, do have not. Lots of other amazing scented candles. Um, all of which again are gonna be available at wizardandcandles.com. Yes. There is a subscription or there. Is a discount if you sign up for the subscription. Yes. So that's kind of the pro tip for you. So link in all the descriptions and show notes and all that type of stuff if you'd like to go and check it out. We would yes. do it. We would very much appreciate it. We sure would. <clears throat> All anyway. right, moving on in the chapter, we get introduced. We get first mention of Lockhart, where Mrs. Weasley instructs her sons to go denome the garden. And then I, I feel like it says, now let's see what Lockhart has to say on the subject, which to me, like it's a good intro. It's just like trying to lay the foundation because you're going to meet Lockhart later in the book. But at the same time, it's like there's no way she doesn't. She, like, I don't think she needs this information. Yeah, like, you know, I agree. And I also highlighted this this particular title in particular, because like we know that like Lockhart's whole shtick is that basically he goes and finds wizards who have accomplished great things who are maybe like less storybook looking or, or or are less looking for fame for their accomplishments and so what he does is he like hears their stories and then he wipes their memory so that they no longer remember doing it and then he claims that he did it and he has the whole story because he's interviewed the person who has done it which brings me to my point that I'm, I'm trying to make here which is that I can't I, it, it, this this particular title Gilderoy Lockhart's Guide to Household Pests yeah who did he track down and whose memory oh, did I he erase know. for this book I, re- I was like this is an odd addition to his like other Otherwise, adventure tales like what it, like th- you needed this on your discography there, Lockhart. You yeah, know? Like, I said I put, this is a little beneath his usual heroics. I know, like <laughs> like th- that to me, you're right? Because otherwise, if one, if he just came up with it by himself, which is almost no chance he did, yeah. then good for you. That sounds like it probably sold pretty well, but. Uh, probably what this means is that somewhere out there is just some friendly wizarding exterminator who has got his mind wiped so that Lockhart could steal 
guide to household pest information from him. Man, when you describe it like that, it truly is devastating. It, I know. It's just like someone who just spent their life learning the ways of Dean Noman Gardens. Learning the waves, you and know. Now, and now they're not even getting credit for all that hard work that they, yes. that they uncovered. Either which way, though, the boys don't really seem to take any of Lockhart's <laughs> advice on it because they've probably just done this task before, as has Mrs. <laughs> Weasley. Yes. Because this is like one of those things that I also love. Uh, this is jumping ahead one page, but we, we eventually learned that the gnomes tend to come back and it's because, uh, who says it here. I think Ron, uh, they love it here. Dad's too soft with them. He thinks they're funny. And I, I just wrote, I love Arthur. Like, he is just such a sweetheart all the time. I know. Like, such did, a good guy. He cares for everything and everyone and everything. Yeah. yeah I love uh, also when Harry sees the garden and just says, it's exactly what a garden should be. And it's just like all lumpy. And like, I love that it's exactly what a garden should be. And included in that is weeds. Like, <laughs> yes, he's yes. like, yep, yep. Garden should have weeds. You got to get out there and get your hands dirty. There's, there should be stuff growing just every just everywhere yeah, of yeah. every variety love that uh, uh, explanation and then also like this is a chore I guess for the boys to go denome the garden but honestly it just sounds fun it kind of does you know? it seems like they make a game out of it just literally instantly I know um, yeah so it says yeah like I think this is this is Ron basically doing the the procedure um, where you take the gnome uh, above your head you swing it in great circles like a lasso uh, and then <laughs> Just heave it off into the yeah, distance. Yeah. Woo! Um, where Ron's first one goes 20 feet, to which Fred says, pitiful. Yeah. <laughs> I bet I can get mine beyond that stump. And this is like growing up with our group of friends. Mm. This is 100% yes. how every great memory we've ever had was formed. Yeah. It was basically like we had no plan of actually doing this particular thing. Then once we discovered that we could push the boundaries on it like a lot, we would and did. And that yeah. became like our whole person. Personalities. That was basically so, it. Yeah. Yeah. I also just like the sentence a few lines later, just the air was soon thick with flying gnomes. <laughs> like, <laughs> like they're throwing so many so fast. There's barely a break in the action. <laughs> right, right. Like, you might think it's overcast, but nope, that's <laughs> gnomes. Those are gnomes. They are just it is thick up there. <laughs> it's fantastic. All right. Uh, if we change, if we uh, turn the page, Mr. Weasley arrives home. He t- says he has nine raids, one of which was Mundungus Fletcher tried to put a hex on me when I had my back turned, which is just our first introduction to Mundungus. This is another one of those two, though, like where we know that um, Mrs. Weasley is never much a fan of Mundungus. Yeah. And kind of given this one sentence alone, probably has very good reason for her position towards him. Yeah. Um, it's like, you tried to hex my husband once upon a time. Of course, I don't like you. Yeah, I know, right? Come on, man. <coughs> yeah. Jeez. Let's see. Um, I had a big line of text here. There's a uh, Mr. Weez is explaining about the door keys, and he says, of course, it's very hard to convict anyone because no muggle would admit their keys keep shrinking. They'll insist they just keep losing it. Bless them. They'll go to any lengths to ignore magic, even if it's staring them in the face, which to me is like, does that mean you're telling them that magic is happening? And they're like, no, it's not magic. I just can't find it. Right, right. Like, I know this is this is like one of those funny ones, though, where it's sort of like everybody has lost their keys. Yes, you know, it like absolutely is. So I, I do think it's really hilarious just to think that it's like it's like, yeah, the reason everybody loses their keys is because they are magically uh, like sort of modified to shrink so that yeah. you lose them. But <laughs> but again, this is another one of those like Arthur Weasley, like just great person moments where he's just like, bless them. Like, <laughs> oh, the poor things the poor things they come up with all these silly reasons magic's right in front of their face <laughs> yeah there we go um the other irony of that particular situation is just simply the fact that hiding from hiding magic from muggles is like the number one cheap chief objective yes. of the entire <coughs> Wizarding like ministry, government. yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then he has to sit there and like, like even when they see it, they don't, they don't believe it. They don't yeah. believe. They just it. assume something else is happening, right? Because why would you assume magic, right? Because you don't even assume magic. So exactly. Nonetheless, apparently there is concern that they will have noticed a flying car. I guess that's uh, too big, but I, I mean, one of just my, f- I remember this being the funniest line in the world when I was a kid. Okay, um, is when Mrs. Weasley <laughs> says, "Your sons flew that car to Harry's house and back last night." Chatted Mrs. Weasley. What have you had to say about that? He goes, did you really? Did it go all right? <laughs> <laughs> he's just like, he's so happy. He's I, like, he so misreads the toad. I know. 
<laughs> She's like, oh, what? It flew. I, I know this. This is one of those moments where, um, <clears throat> like, as a kid, I remember hearing this sentence for the first time, and it was like a daydream of mine to have one of the instances where, like, like mom complaining to dad or dad complaining to mom, where the other parent basically responds with this exact candor. Yeah, you know, where it would sort of be like the kids were playing in the mud all day. Were you really? Way to go, boys. Yeah. Like, you know, like it's like one of those things where it's like nothing I wanted more was for one parent to think that I had done something like dastardly look wrong while the other parent was like, good job. Right. Like, that, that's that's what I was trying to I like for. how that's what you're going for. You want one to be mad and one to be proud, not both to be proud. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, if one's got to be mad, then I w- at least want the other one to be proud. Right. I know. I could. I'm surprised. Yeah, I could see it happening. Like your kids were up in the trees building a fort today with hammers and saws. And be like, well, can you go in it? Let me see uh, it, you know. Tell me more. Come on, let's go. How stable is yeah. it? <laughs> Can I come? <laughs> I want to have a sleepover. I want to play in the fort. I know exactly. <laughs> that is oh, exactly man. how it would go with me. Yeah, I um, know. Yeah, so yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that probably will happen. Yeah, yep. Addison's gonna come in one day and be like, "Dad, I built a fort." Mom's really mad and be like, "Why?" <laughs> <laughs> Sounds so cool. <laughs> Sounds great. Um, this is not. I, I highlighted this just because it was like it seemed like a fun little bit of trivia, but something I I've always it, it mentions Ginny's eye color as bright brown eyes, which I don't know. I think I think because Harry is always described as having his mother's eyes and Harry's eyes are green and Ginny kind of also has the red hair like Lily. I think I always assumed her eyes were green, but clearly they're not. <laughs> well, not so clearly they're not. So I'm kind of interested that you brought it up like that because in the audiobook, which is reading from the original uh, the the original U.S. version. So oh. Jim Dale <laughs> reads the original U.S. version. Stephen Fry oh. reads the original U.K. version. Um, but it says green in the audiobook. They changed it. They changed it. What? Yeah. So I don't I don't know if this is like one of those situations where it was like you can't have Ginny be too much like Lily. Like Lily reincarnated. But wait a second. How old? No. That'd be really weird. I can see where you're going. The uh, timing is the odd. T- the time. What is her birthday? She is a year younger than Harry, and Harry yeah, is a year old when his mom dies. That's kind of weird. It's I like mean, a- if like if Ginny's birthday is like November first or something, then it's really, really weird. That is really weird, man. Oh. That would be that would be like a discovery happening live in motion. That I mean, would. of course, There's someone would have connected those dots by now. Maybe. Almost certainly, but yes. then it's sort of weird. See if see if it says when Ginny's birthday Let's is. Let's see. Do we know when is Ginny? Weasley's. Sorry, birthday. guys. This is one of those moments where we have to. We're getting sidetracked. It's August 11th. August 11th. Yes. Okay. August 11th, 1981. So she, she would is be like born before. Before the attack. Before okay. the attack. Yes. She's alive. Ooh. Before the attack. That was dangerously close. Narrowly missed it. I would have lost my but mind. But that would have been like, so weird if Harry was dating the reincarnated version of his mom. It, no, it would be. It would be extremely strange. <laughs> yeah. But like the, the parallels between Ginny and Lily are oh, like uncanny. Uncanny. So anyway. But they changed the eyes. Why do they change? They must. That must be why they changed her eye color. Like too much. Too much. Like too Lily. similar to Lily. Yeah. That's got to be the reason. Yeah. Wow. It's a weird one. So in our book, it says bright brown. In the audio, it says green. Yeah. I mean, when you brought that up, I was like, oh, he caught the same thing as me. And then you yeah. didn't. And it was so different. And I was like, oh, this is so great. <coughs> Okay, that's very interesting. Okay, okay. Yeah, and then uh, let's see. Uh, Ron is covered. Ron shows Harry his room. He's covered nearly every inch of the shabby wallpaper with posters of the same seven witches and wizards. Um, in addition to that, he's also got a. Uh, this was this is like one of the things that always stands out to me. But um, in addition, he's got like comic books called The Adventures of um, Martin Miggs, the Mad Muggle, which yes. is, I think is a good trivia piece. Uh, following that is Ron's wand lying on top of a fish tank full of frog spawn on the window. So there is a frog pond on the borough's property. Yes. So almost certainly this is quite literally like frog eggs that will then hatch into tadpoles. Yeah. Um, but the kind of hilarious thing from my perspective is that uh, as a bit of a saltwater <coughs> aquarium enthusiast, there is a coral uh, that I keep in just about every saltwater aquarium I've ever set up called frog spawn. Oh, that's funny. So in my head, I always picture it like he's got, like oh, a, look, tank, he's got like like, that. Like a tank full yeah, of like euphelia, funny. which is the scientific name for frog yes. spawn. Also right next to the 
frog spawn is his fat gray rat scabbers, which is just like it, man, when you, I don't know why, like it's always gross that scabbers is Peter, but it's like the fact that he's just right there. He's right there. I know. There's a grown man in that room with them. I know, it's and sick. it is so, oh, it's just like, oh, he's right there. And it's so gross. And it's, ah, Peter sucks so much. I, know. Peter, I hate him. Peter, Peter um, really is. He's like one of those characters where it's like, I, it's like there's a piece of me that can like find sympathy for so many characters, but I feel like Umbridge and Peter are are oh. two of the ones where it's just like I I can't even find like a, like an edge to like like a, like a finger hold to I like know. try to give them some credit Man. on. Okay, so also speaking of the Chud- going back to the Chudley Cannons for a second, um, one it sounds like there are posters literally all over the wall. And when I was starting to think about this, I was trying to imagine being in a room the size of Ron's where every single piece of the wall was moving, like if every picture on the wall was moving. Oh my gosh! I was just like this sounds. So overstimulating. Yeah, having literally like, just gotten off a cruise last yeah. week where there can be something a little bit jarring about like feeling like you're standing on stable ground and then looking out at the horizon and like like the ocean is moving past you. Yeah. It's it's like a very like unnerving feeling. Yeah. It feels like that's how this would be. Yes. Okay. Also, um, he mentions that the Chudley Cannons are ninth in the league, which I assumed at first reading was out of nine. <laughs> it does feel that way. Yeah. It does feel that way. And <laughs> Uh, I think probably they do end up bottom of the league because Dumbledore at some point says like as sure as the Chudley Cannons will finish bottom of the league again. Uh, I don't know what book that's in, but it sounds like they're frequently towards the bottom. But actually, there are 12 teams in the league, which means at the moment the Chudley Cannons are ninth out of 12, which is ninth, which is three quarters. (laughs) Oh, that's hilarious. (laughs) Yeah, not yeah, Nine, which is three quarters of the way. 12. Yeah, Yeah, that's amazing. (laughs) That's amazing. That's that's that was a good piece of (coughs) thank you. Good piece of fun (coughs) fun discovery there. That's always a good one. Um, Then uh, yeah, basically as we sort of like close out the chapter here, it almost feels as though the uh, sending of the boys out into the yard to denome the garden was maybe something that Mrs. Weasley was mostly just doing to punish them for their evening uh, adventure because we can see that the gang of gnomes is just sneaking one by one back through the. I know. It's like what an unsuccessful. Yeah, it's like this didn't work at all. That or they should have read Lockhart's book. I know. Yeah, maybe they didn't yet. We know how to denome a garden. It sounds like you don't. Yeah, sounds yeah. like you don't, or maybe Mr. Weasley's <coughs> just too soft on them. I know exactly that, and, and if I mean, if Mr. Weasley's too soft on them, then it feels like Mrs. Weasley knows that the gnomes are just gonna come back. Over right, it's just like it's this like, is just something to go do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So anyway, as we as we close out, there's there's just like last little brick of text on the last page. It says it's a bit mo- it's a bit small. Said Ron quickly, not like that room you had with the Muggles. And I'm right underneath the ghoul in the attic. He's always banging on the pipes and groaning, but but Harry grinning widely said, "This is the best house I've ever been in." And Ron's ears went pink. I know. I just love that whole sentence. It's just so great. It's so good. I it's feel like I almost wish it didn't say Ron's ears went pink. It just said this is the best house I've ever been in. I know. I agree. I mean, because yeah. it could have just ended right there and just been like just like, such a oh. such a great thing. And it, I, I just think it goes it goes to show that like none of the Dursleys quirks or ways of life <coughs> or anything their whole perspective none of it has worn off on harry in any way yeah like he doesn't appreciate anything about the way yeah, that he's not like life. oh shouldn't it be like that right 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 it's <laughs> he's like, like everything is the complete opposite here and by the complete opposite it's 100 percent right <laughs> yeah, i yeah. love it in every single way yes um so i do love that and as i've gotten older this is this is like one of the ones that i was like kind of like emotionally gut punches me um it's just i i think the way that molly will continuously sort of like take a degree of um, like a position of like motherhood over Harry Mm -hmm. is is it grows as like one of my favorite aspects of the whole story is just the relationship between those people that like these are such kind and caring and giving individuals that like they without a second's note like like without a second of hesitation despite the fact that they are like impoverished or or you know poor as as they are described as being like it's nothing for them to take on someone else um in the form of harry yep so, yep i love well that said yeah i love that and, and i think it's just uh it's th- this this chapter in particular that's what i wrote at the end is it just like i said i wrote i love this chapter so much uh and i think it's because it's like this is like the the real true like i mean we've, we've seen mrs weasley help harry at the platform like we know that that's that's like been a thing so far um but this is like the the real entry of like harry kind of being like a a surrogate son to the family so. you know we theorized dumbledore's big plan wise that 
like Mrs. Weasley calling out, what's the platform number is like specifically to get Harry's attention. Yes. Do you? Yep. S- I mean, sort of the same thing. Do you suppose her bringing up what does Lockhart have to say on the subject fall into that same category? Like as a way like she already knows Lockhart will be there or something <coughs> like this is. A, yeah. Let me tell you about Lockhart real quick, Harry. Or I don't know. It seems possible. Yeah. It doesn't seem unlikely to me, although it does. It does feel as though um, like Molly does have like a, a, a sort of um, y- you crush. Know, like, like, a, like a crush yeah, or, or a fascination with with Lockhart in a way that's probably like a little bit of like a guilty pleasure or something. Yeah. Um, so I, it, it's a little bit hard to tell with that particular one. Um, yeah. But but possibly possibly um, um, unless the other piece there is that again, it, it's just going back to this thought that she's like, I'm going to make you go do a senseless task as your punishment instead of going to go sleep because this does feel like one of those things where it's like if surely if the kids had just woken up from their beds, they wouldn't have been asked to go and denome the garden. Right. Yeah. You know, like sure. Necessarily on this particular day. Yeah, um, that's true. So th- this could be maybe it's just part of like the, the demeaning. It's like I'm going to make you listen to someone else's method because I know you guys are going to go out there and make sport <coughs> of this thing. That's true. That could be the yeah. thing. But boy, speaking of Lockhart, and I won't comment on it right now, but oh my God, the chapter art for the next chapter. Oh my God. Not going to say anything, but wow, can't wait to talk about it. Oh, that was going to be so <laughs> much fun. So yeah, that, that, that'll close out chapter three, The Burrow from Chamber of Secrets. We are now looking ahead to chapter four at Flourish and Blots. Yes, should be, uh, should be lots of fun. A lot of stuff happens in the next chapter. Otherwise, thank you so much uh, for listening to today's episode and for subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, if you want to click that subscribe button, it's like a little happy birthday present for me. That would be amazing. There we go. We're up to 24,000 subscribers on YouTube. Thank you guys so much. That is like so cool. That's it. We're just, you know, one step closer to our uh, goal of that silver play button. I know. It's going to be so much fun. Yeah. So much fun. We're yeah. almost at 25. That'd be a quarter of the way there. How about that? Then we'll only have three quarters of the way to go. Uh, we love three quarters. We sure do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But otherwise, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time through the Gryffindor.